You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hi, David. Hi, Will. And hello, listeners. Welcome to episode 63 of the Common Descent Podcast. And today's episode is one I've been looking forward to because we are talking about sexual selection. Yes, a very cool topic. Yeah, this one's this one's odd because it's something we're aware of but does not get discussed in detail very often or at least gets confused or misunderstood. Half the things I looked up had some line in there about how it is one of the most misunderstood or often misreferenced pieces of evolutionary pressures. Intriguing. Let's see if we can demystify it a bit. Indeed. But before we get into the topics, so brief intro before we continue on. Sexual selection is the pressure on organisms. It's an evolutionary pressure like natural selection, but instead of selecting for the best survivors, it's selecting for those who can reproduce most successfully. And so this is what leads to all those weird mating dances and displays that we see in animals. And it has some very interesting and odd side effects on the animals and other organisms. But what we'll be focusing on is what is sexual selection? What are some of its side effects? And since we are the Common Descent Podcast, how or when have we been able to study this in the fossil record? You know, what are our limitations there and what... What examples of it have we found or been able to find? Yeah, we touched on it a bit in episode 53, Mm -hmm. the baculum episode, but this time we'll go into a bit deeper detail. Because it's a very wide spanning topic, covers a lot of different interesting concepts, and we, as usual, are not going to be able to cover it all, but we'll give you a, a glimpse inside the realm of sexual selection. And this episode topic was requested by Jonathan through Gmail. So thank you, Jonathan. Thanks, Jonathan. We're looking forward to discussing this topic for you. We also got a request for dinosaur sexual dimorphism from Lydia on Facebook, so we'll be discussing that as well this episode. And now, as we move on to the episode, before we get to our discussion, we have some announcements. First and foremost, as has become basically a tradition now, we have some patrons to mention because... If you sign up on our Patreon at a certain level, we'll shout your name out at the void here on the podcast, and we have a bunch of names today. So welcome, Tom, Allison, Alexander, Brittany, and Paige to the Baskin Coil. Welcome to the party, everybody. Yeah, thanks so much. Boy, our Patreon is doing swimmingly. It is awesome. (laughs) It's so cool. We are so excited to have this many devoted fans. Absolutely, we are, and appreciated immensely, because it's allowing us to do cool stuff Like one of our other announcements for today is that at the end of the month, we will be going to NAPC, the North American Paleontology Conference in California. Thanks to Patreon is why I'm getting to go. Yeah, and we will be giving a talk. Yes, we will. We will be presenting. Presenting about the podcast and our experience doing science communication through the podcast. So thanks so much to everyone who supported it. And hopefully, and I have to send the email... We will be recording our talk. Yes, that's the plan. So hopefully we'll be able to have you all listen to it, even if you're not present. Ah, so we're very excited for that. Another just bit of announcement for any of you who have been listening avidly. You're probably already aware of it, but we do have a mini series that we are currently in just past the middle of right now. We are in another Silver Screen Science uh, June series, Kai June. That should have two more episodes left for you to listen to by the time you're downloading this. So listen for those every Saturday and keep your ears out for those episodes. We're talking about giant monsters, specifically King Kong Godzilla, leading up to the new Godzilla movie that's come out this month. And it's been so much fun. Oh, so much fun. Take a listen. And finally, if any of you are noticing that this episode sounds at all different, if our conversation stands out anyway. It might be because we're actually in the same room this time. Because I'm in Tennessee now. 
Will moved up. I did. We are in the same room, in the same state, in the same apartment. Yeah. This is the first episode, the first main numbered yes. episode of the podcast that has been recorded in the same room. Yes. In the same room, in the same state. <laughs> On the same microphone. <laughs> this has been a Skype project since its inception two and a half years we've been doing this on skype it has been it has been very good for us to learn a lot of techniques but man it's so much nicer just to be able to set up a mic and start talking yeah i could reach out and touch will i'm doing it right now you <gasps> can't see it it's like i'm really here <laughs> <laughs> this is the real life very my immersion <laughs> and actually speaking of patrons and speaking of will being in tennessee i wanted to make mention that just the other day one of our longest running fans got to come by and visit the Gray Fossil site and meet us. Yes. So shout out to Nick because that was super cool. It was so much fun. So, hey, if you're in the area, we're both here now. Yes. And the Fossil site's super cool. Come on by. We'll show you around if we can. It was it was wonderful. So we, we would happily, happily share that experience again. And that's going to wrap up our announcements for this episode, which, of course, brings us to the news. It's news time. As always, we like to cover some recent news topics in the realms of paleontology, geology, evolution, and so forth to keep us up to date, to keep you up to date. And so to kick us off, I will pass it across the table to ah, David. That's me. I brought to the news this time a, an, a new study about the giant Ice Age beaver. Yes. Castoroides. So, listeners, if you haven't heard of this, there was a giant Ice Age beaver. This study has not discovered the beaver, but it has determined what it was eating. Hmm. This is research in scientific reports by Tessa Plint et al. And we'll link to an article in The Conversation, which is a website that lets authors write basically popular article, less technical articles about their own research. Yes. This article was written by Tessa Plint. Castoroides was a beaver that lived toward in, in the Pleistocene epoch, the Ice Age. But unlike modern beavers, it was the size of a black bear. Wow. This is a hundred kilogram beaver. So this is a beaver that was heavier than either one of us. Which is ridiculous like beavers are already too big for rodents oh yeah they're big rodents but this, this is huge <laughs> this is a bear-sized beaver <laughs> they were super widespread florida up to alaska here in north america went extinct around ten thousand years ago around the time all those other extinctions were happening that we discussed in episode 25 and for a long time the questions have been sort of how does this extinct giant beaver castoroides genus castoroides compare to our living beaver genus castor were they doing similar things now part of that question is likely answered by the fact that castoroides is shaped differently does not have the big paddle tail like Ooh. modern beavers do instead it has a long skinny tail kind of like a muskrat also its teeth are different castoroides teeth are curved and bulky and not as sharp as a modern beaver which has led people to suspect maybe it's doing something different. On the other hand, these giant beaver fossils are most common in wetland sediments, which is similar to modern beavers. They seem to be most successful during warm and wet times, also more or less in line with how modern beavers are. So this study, these authors set out to find out what they were eating, big major part of their ecology. In order to do this, they did a technique that we've discussed before called stable isotope analysis. Cool. Which functions under the principle that you are what you eat. Eat different kinds of foods, whether it's fish versus land meat, whether it's grasses versus browsing, have different chemical signatures, and when you eat them, you are building your body out of those chemicals. So your body will have the same signatures as the food. They tested giant beaver fossils from the Yukon and Ohio ranging from 50,000 to 10,000 years ago, for their food signature. And they found that Castoroides' tooth signature, its chemical stable isotope signature, mostly matched aquatic plants. Oh, That it was eating aquatic submerged vegetation. They did not find evidence to suggest that it was feeding on woody plants. 
which is significant if it's going to call itself a beaver. Yes, so that suggests, along with the morphological differences, that these giant beavers were probably not cutting down trees and chewing on bark and stuff. Instead, they were living in the water and eating the plants. Oh. I mean, it makes sense that an animal scaled up, I don't know how many times, 20 times? A lot. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> would not keep the exact same lifestyle. Like like a capybara does not behave like a mouse. No. You know, and a house cat and a tiger have similarities, but they're, one's taking down something that's like half its weight. The other one's taking down something that weighs less than its head. Yeah. So it makes sense that when you scaled something up, it wouldn't maintain the same behavior, but it it is, I I think it's just intriguing because beavers are such a unique behavior that we as- and, we, and we associate with them so heavily yeah you hear beaver and you picture a very particular lifestyle but could you imagine the size of the den oh my goodness that castroides would make just living in redwood forests and cutting <laughs> down trees and building huge houses just size. giant <laughs> mansion beaver mansions now the authors do actually suggest that this difference in behavior might relate to why one is extinct and the other isn't. Oh. That during the end of the Pleistocene, that time period where you were losing a lot of your megafauna, now granted, large animals suffer first in the times of extinction, as we discussed, but it was also a time where temperatures around the globe were getting warmer and a lot of wetlands were receding. So the fact that it relied on aquatic plants and wetland habitats and couldn't engineer its ecosystem like modern beavers do which is a big one might be part at least part of why they didn't survive to the present whereas their smaller den building cousins did it is uh important to note that beavers are one of the very few organisms outside of humans that can willingly you know not just by its presence because like coral does not make a reef you know uh 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 on on purpose it doesn't choose to make it. that's just how it is it's just how that's what happens from it growing but beavers are one of the only other animals other than us that can change in an an ecosystem can yep. reformat it to from river to lake yes so it is that is very important to note that that may have been what allowed them to get through some stuff because if their their ecosystem's diminishing they can make it again a very unique lifestyle it's one of the things that's made us so su- successful is it's cold here i'm gonna build a warm house it's hot here i'm going to just build shade absolutely very interesting indeed cool well my first bit of news is about crocodilian history what yes indeed surprise surprise you know i thought when we pulled you out of florida maybe you'd lose some of that crocodilian influence yeah, yeah. Hasn't worked yet. You can take the person out of Florida, but you can't take the crocodilians <laughs> out of how awesome they are. I don't know. I don't have, I'm not from Florida, so I don't have like... <laughs> yeah, it's just, just crocs. <laughs> this is research into not just the history of crocodilians, but the history of warm or cold-blooded ectothermy and endothermy, uh, or endothermy, ectothermy, within the group. Because... It's more, it seems from this research, more complicated than we initially thought. So this is research by George Kubo and Noor Edin Jalil in Paleobiology. And the article we're linking to is uh, by Escher Elbin in the New York Times. So just to give some background, once again, endothermy and ectothermy are what typically are referred to as warm-blooded and cold-blooded. And there has long been debates as to which fossil animals fall into which groups. But nowadays, it is leaning much more toward, as modern birds are warm-blooded, very likely at least a portion of dinosaurs were, or some form of it as well. And this kind of raises the question of, if that's the case, why is the other half of the archosaurs, the crocodilians and their ancestors, cold-blooded? Why are they ectotherms? Because modern-day... Crocodiles, alligators, and their cousins are indeed fully ectothermic. They get all their heat from the environment, whilst birds get their heat from 
internal metabolism. Right. So the assumption there would be that in the archosaur evolutionary history, warm-bloodedness, endothermy, didn't arise until after crocs and dinosaurs had split off from exactly. each other. Exactly. That cold-bloodedness is the ancestral trait yes. to archosaurs, and crocs never quite upgraded to warm-blooded. And this makes sense on the surface, but there's a couple of things that caused confusion. And it's mostly the internal biology of crocodilians. Crocodilians have a few weird features that quote-unquote shouldn't be in an ectotherm. And we've mentioned these before, but some of them being like having gizzards, being able to walk straight-limbed under the body like dinosaurs did having a four-chambered heart, having bird-like respiration, are all things that are very, and this is not a perfect word, but, you know, very advanced. Yeah, they're things you tend to see associated with higher metabolism, higher body temperature. Higher activity animals. They're endo. They're the traits we expect to see in endothermic animals. It's, that, it, it's walking and talking like a duck, but it's not. No, but it's a crocodile. It's a crocodile. <laughs> and we're trying to figure out why that is so they wanted to look through the history of crocodilians to see where there might be some answers in the ancestry the initial thought was that these features were relics from the crocodilian the crocodilla morph lineage being at that transition point between cold and warm-blooded but not fully making it. Not committing. Yeah, so they got some of the traits, as all of archosaurs were, but they split before they actually got to warm-bloodedness. Well, to look at this, they decided to go to some early archosaurs and look at the crocodiliform ancestors. They decided to look at Azindosaurus, which is a Triassic herbivore. Uh, it, it's a very unique animal. Its skull actually got misidentified as an early dinosaur uh and at its initial discovery, and to they wanted to look at this animal, which has ancestry with modern crocodilians, to see what its metabolism looked like. So they took some of the bones and did histology, which we've mentioned before is when you slice very thinly to look at the growth and features within the bone. They also looked at 14 other related archosaurs, and took tissue and metabolic data from living species of amphibian, lizards, turtles, crocodilians, mammals, and birds. Large study. This is taking a lot of metabolism data to try to get a read on this early archosaur. And what they found is that it's resting metabolism, so not when it's exercising and not when it's, you know, in a deep sleep or hibernation, just normal sitting around is significantly higher than most living ectotherms, so most cold-blooded animals today, which suggests that it may have been some form of warm-blooded. They said it was actually similar to living mammals and birds. This is the same kind of thing we discussed in episode 51 that has been observed in mosasaurs. Exactly. That it, it has the si a signature relating to body temperature closer to mammals and birds than to fish and classic reptiles. Which, if this is true endothermy, true warm-bloodedness, it suggests some big stuff. First, it suggests that the archosaur lineage is ancestrally warm-blooded, which would mean that the crocodilomorphs lost it somewhere yeah, along the way. Secondarily cold-blooded. Yes, which would explain why they have those warm-blooded features, but not a warm-blooded metabolism. It would also push it back, the origins of endothermy, to the Permian period more than 260 million years ago. So that's farther back than we initially thought it would have it had arisen. This would make sense since many of the early, you know, crocodilian ancestors were terrestrial and seemed to be very active, you know, long legged compared to the modern ones and more upright stances for many of them. So it makes sense that they were very active and warm-blooded and it's suggested that they may have transitioned to a cold-blooded nature while going to the water with which is what all the modern groups are are aquatic and they, they are not the only groups there are many fossil groups that went into the water but that transitioning the water now 
if you're making your own heat, you're having to fight the heat sapping uh, 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 features of water. You know, water's going to cool you down, so you're wasting energy keeping yourself warm in there unless you get some sort of insulation like blubber. You also can now benefit from holding your breath longer if you're cold-blooded, and that's very helpful for many aquatic reptiles nowadays. And the slower metabolism would help with things like alligators hibernating through winters or crocodiles, saltwater crocodiles moving across the ocean and being able to survive long periods without food because that's something else they're extremely good at is fasting for long periods. Yeah, that's something that I think, uh, my guess is that it would relate largely to their lifestyle. Because when I think of, of crocodilians today, they occupy this long standing niche of shoreline ambush predators. Exactly. And I love the notion. I've heard this before. This I've heard this idea that crocodilians are secondarily cold blooded, bounced around for years. Mm -hmm. And I like it because it's so counterintuitive from the perspective of warm blooded creatures where it's easy to assume that warm bloodedness is always the better option. Yes. But if your lifestyle benefits from eating something in the wet season and then sitting and waiting for six months for the food to come back, you want to be cold blooded. Absolutely. You want to be ectothermic. You want to be able to shut down. So the notion that these crocs may have moved into a niche that is, you know what? We got all this machinery running and it's just a huge, we got to start making some cuts in here and go back to that and that, that earlier ancestral form that's such a cool evolutionary trend. Absolutely. Well, it's the same thing that snakes do where they're able to just sit and wait like a bear trap for something to stumble across them. If they were warm-blooded, they'd have to be chasing food down. Yep. And that would be very difficult for animals who have developed very unusual body designs, good at certain things, but not necessarily others. So it's it's a very interesting proposal. Now, people have come out to say... Not that we have a problem with the research, but that this conclusion may be a step too far. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris Brochu, for one of them, who is renowned crocodilian paleontologist, cautions that the that those early ancestors very well may have shown higher metabolism because of the warmer climate. Right, and just like a lizard in the desert versus a lizard in the mountains, the lizard in the desert can be very quick, or in Florida, for instance. Very quick, very high energy. You know, they move around like a mouse. Right. You know, so a higher temperature might sh seem more warm-blooded when you look at the histology, but not actually be physiologically warm-blooded. They also caution that we we need to be careful about using just the warm, cold-blooded distinction. Yeah. That there is not two options. It is a gradient. And those are the two extremes, but there are animals that are mesothermic, somewhere in between those two. They are kind of warm-blooded, but also kind of not. Yeah, like naked mole rats. Like naked mole or rats. Those fish. Yeah, great that white I, sharks are a great example of sharks. this, where they warm themselves only if they're swimming, because their muscles are doing the warming. Yep. So if they stop swimming, they cool right down. This is, this is something that they're kind of cautioning against, is maybe... Maybe, but also maybe it was not that far. You know, maybe it's somewhere in the middle. Right. So still information to be, you know, uh, uh, teased through with this, but a very interesting. Uh, I was very, I thought it was very cool. Fascinating stuff. Yes. Well, my next bit of news, uh, speaking of cold blooded things, well, we'll go into true ectothermy. This is a bit of news about a fossilized school of fish which is just wow yeah research in the proceedings of the royal society b by nobuaki mizumoto et al and we'll link to an article in science news by carolyn wilk this research concerns a slab of limestone shale dating back to the eocene epoch so we're looking at 40 50 million years ago originally discovered in the famous Green River Formation, which you can find out west here on this continent, Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, but which the researchers noticed in a museum in Japan. Ooh. Sitting around waiting for someone to come along and notice it. What makes the limestone slab interesting is that it contains fossils of an extinct fish 
named Arismetopterus levatus, but not just one or two of these fish, 259 fish. Wow. They are all 10 to 20 or so millimeters long, so tiny little fish. Yeah. 200 plus tiny little fish, all facing the same direction. <laughs> which is which is the important part. Which suggests that something, you know, a dune collapsed or there was an underwater landslide of some kind that captured all of these fish in a moment. If you think back to our recent episode about prehistoric behavior, episode 61, these are extremely rare and extremely valuable moments to, to look at prehistoric ancient animals caught in the act of doing something. In this case, the researchers use this fossil as a me method of looking at collective behavior. Mm -hmm. Fish school. If you've ever looked at nature documentaries or watched Finding Nemo, you see fish grouped together in schools, especially little fish, because it's a great strategy, safety in numbers, you look bigger, you're harder to single out from the crowd, same reason zebras travel in herds and things like that. But what's really difficult to know is how long fish have been doing this. And what the researchers point out, and this I think is a really cool way to, to think about it, modern fish maintain schools, you know, because you look at it, it's a big cooperative behavior and it's odd to think that a little tiny fish is planning out this whole schooling operation. But the authors point out that they maintain it with very simple individual instructions. And they are that each fish follows the general two rules of moving away from the closest fish and towards slightly farther fish. Interesting. And that this is apparently the pattern we see in modern schooling fish, that when the fish get too close, they move away from each other and they will look at another fish and move towards it that is farther away. And just that simple command mm -hmm. in each fish leads to this emergent schooling behavior that's fa i knew i had heard of things like that with flocking birds that mm -hmm. the way that the you know the, those um oh what is it the the giant flocks that you see just those black clouds oh of birds. yeah yeah the murmurations mm -hmm. and they seem to move in just such weird like laser show ways of making different shapes and that it's purely the same kind of concept it's not them making a flock it's each bird just keeping track of i think it was the three birds around them mm -hmm. and that they're just maintaining their position with those three birds and so they're not keeping track of the whole group just a trio around them and that allows the entire group to work as a unit yep it's like i i've never been in the military but i assume that mm -hmm you know your place in the rank or like in band well yeah that's a like marching band you know where you go and you know what you do in relation to the people around you and you don't really have to think about the full formation as long as you have your individual commands well it's it uh what i thought it was being in a play where it's yep you know when you go on stage and you know what your part is you don't pay attention to what everyone else is like unless it's the person you're acting across from if it's the person on the other side of the stage doing something, they're having their cues and they're having their stuff. Like, you're, you're just doing your part, and as long as everyone does their part, a play happens. So these researchers looked at these fish, and based on the orientations of the fish in relation to each other, assuming they're captured more or less in their lifelike position, it looks like they're doing the same thing. Following these same basic rules of moving away from the fish that are too close and towards the fish that are a little farther away. That's awesome. Which suggests that this is a very ancient pattern of behavior. Eocene is 50 million years ago. Yeah, that's significant. That suggests that this behavior originated quite some time ago and has remained consistent in fish. Which is super fun, and what an incredible thing to be able to see. As always, we'll put these links in the blog post. Click this one, because the picture of this slab is super cool. It's beautiful. It's just a just... ton of fish. And I, this is another one of those. I love when we have these moments. Of, people have been doing documentaries of ancient fish schooling together for a long time. Because 
I mean, it makes sense. That's what fish do. Fish school, and it's a it's obviously beneficial. But it's always nice to be like, well, that was just a cool idea back then. I mean, it's you know, it was idea based off of modern behavior, but it was just an idea. Yeah. No actual fossil evidence yes. directly. Now we have some. Sure do. So now, now those cool ideas that made sense make sense for uh, a evidence based reason now, <laughs> which I enjoy. Yeah. Incidentally, I just called them a ton of fish. It's probably like twenty pounds of fish. Yeah. These are very small fish. A metaphorical ton. <laughs> A fish ton. <laughs> so my next bit of news is um, about a new crocodile. What? Um, oh my so- good! Just doubling down on <laughs> this. I just, I'm going through withdrawals. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Not technically a crocodile, a crocodile form, but it was found in Texas, and as the news articles have been describing it, an oddball croc. Hmm. It's a little bit different than what we expect to see today. So this is research by Noto et al. in the in the anatomical record. And the article we're linking to is from Michael Greshko in National Geographic. So in Dallas, Texas, there is a fossil deposit called the Texas Arlington Archosaur site that dates back to the Cretaceous, roughly 96 million years ago, and is a very rich fossil site with all sorts of cool stuff. It records what was a Delta River system and has all sorts of cool stuff. It has dinosaurs, plants, fish, uh, another huge crocodile form, Delta Sucus, and nine species of turtle and possibly a little snake. Ooh. So all there, right. Now I'm interested. So there you go. Now I'm on board. See? See? You know your audience, folks. <laughs> it also has a bunch of copper lights and, and cool stuff like that. So hey, we like copper lights. Copper lights are always good. Episode 30. Well... Found at this site recently is a new crocodiliform named Scolomastix salistini. And this was not a big croc. It was about six, three to six feet long. You know, so it's about the same size as the Chinese alligator today or your dwarf crocodile or caiman. So about the same size as our smallest species of crocs and alligators today. This crocodiliform had, uh, they had a lower right jaw that implies it had fewer teeth than its modern cousins interesting and different shaped teeth the teeth were not uniform which Uh, they were heterodont they were heterodont now modern crocodiles and alligators do have some heterodonty the back teeth are blunter the front teeth are sharper certain teeth are larger and more robust so there is a little bit there Eh, they're all basically Themes, uh, they're all di- just variations on the same theme. Right. Heterodonty means having different types of teeth for different purposes. And that's the key. Much like you do, and much like a corn snake does not. Yes. Well, this one shows some signs of that, which suggests that it was omnivorous, eating more than just meat, also some plants. Cool. Which this is not the first herbivorous uh, croc relative that we've talked about. Now, Scolomastix is what they call a para-alligatoroid. So this group is best known from Asia. Hmm. So this is basically saying it's closer to alligators than crocs, but not actually an alligator. Right. Like Dinosuchus. Yes, absolutely. And this Asia connection reinforces that animals living in Asia and North America were able to mix across those ranges during the early Cretaceous, but then when North America got split in two by that the the uh, just western went... interior seaway thank you yeah i'm here in the room now yeah i know <laughs> the western interior seaway split the continent into two sides laramidia and appalachia exactly this strengthens that connection especially since this is the first para alligatoroid found in appalachia deposits in the eastern half of north yes. america from the cretaceous very cool which is cool and a little fun note about its name a, one of the local amateur paleontologists who helped find the site, so is you know well known there, but also helped discover Scolomastix is Art Salstein, who they worked into the species name to give him credit for helping to discover this animal. Always cool to be able to name a fossil species after someone who helped. I like that, which is really fun. There you go. Yeah, so a cool little crocodiliform here in in the U.S. Not bad for a croc. 
Absolutely. And that's going to wrap up our news. So we will continue into our discussion of sexual selection. We'll talk a little bit about what this concept is and what are some examples. How does it work and what does it do? What? How does this affect an animal's evolution after this break? So sexual selection is a branch of the evolutionary selection pressures. Now, most of us already know about natural selection. This is similar in the fact that it is affecting an animal's fitness, you know, but it is not survival based. It is reproduction based. Right. Instead of competing against other members of your species or other species for resources, you're either competing against other members of the same sex mm -hmm. for access to reproduction, or in interesting ways, you're competing against the opposite sex of your own species for, for lack of a nicer word, control over reproductive rights. And that's instead of going for, you know, the limiting factor in natural selection is that there are more babies born than there are resources to feed them. And this one is there are more animals that want to mate than the chances for the, all of them to mate usually. Yes. So that's is whoever can mate the most is sexual selection wise the most fit. Right, cuz you're if you're mating the most you're having the most babies. Absolutely. And that's what this is really all about is passing on those genes to the next generation. So they they often work hand in hand, you know. If you're if you are successful natural selection wise, you know you're strong or you're healthy or you're smarter, whatever it is, lucky. You're going to have better odds when the sexual selection comes around. Right, those traits that let you more effect efficiently digest your food or mm -hmm. find your food or avoid your predators, that you're going to survive to have baby time. But on the flip side, they can often kind of be in contention with one another because sexual selection doesn't care about you surviving it just cares about if you survive long enough to have babies and so there's a weird dichotomy with these two right kind of contradiction the traits that allow you to reproduce to attract a mate to 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 get to where you need to go aren't the same necessarily as the traits that allow you to get your food, avoid predators, etc. Exactly. Showing off to the ladies is different from hiding from the tiger, and so the body is kind of being pulled in multiple directions, evolutionarily speaking. Now, this may make you think that, you know, we all know, or at least most, you know, it's fairly common knowledge that natural selection came up from Darwin, especially since we've talked about it in our Darwin episode. In episode 28, and also in the episode about the history of evolutionary thought, which was episode 56. Indeed. So natural selection was the first thing Darwin suggested in Origin of the Species as his answer for how evolution was driven. It may be then easy to think that sexual selection came up somewhere down the line. No, Darwin also said sexual selection. A smart guy, that Darwin. It just wasn't what became famous right at the beginning because there was a bit more controversy around it, or at least around part of it. So in 1859, when Darwin wrote The Origin of Species, he proposed the concept of sexual selection because natural selection did not answer the non-adaption traits. So by that I mean what David was saying, strong forelimbs or sharp claws there is a definite connection between that and my survival. But long peacock feathers or bright colors don't seem to fit any survival adaptation. So he started looking for a mechanism to answer for these. And his obvious conclusion was these are there to help them mate. Yep. So sexual selection was proposed. And then he furthered it in... The Descent of Man and Selection in Radiation to Sex. In and, relation. Yes. <clears throat> and Selection in Relation to Sex that he released in 1871. So 1871 was when sexual selection truly was on the books to be discussed. 
And he described two main methods. And these are the ones that we've mentioned already to a, mentioned already to a degree, which is intrasexual selection and intersexual selection. Intra is members of the same sex, usually males, attempting to beat the others to the to the mating uh, arena. To the, yes, to the arena, <laughs> to, the, to, to the, the mating arena. opportunity. Yes, and so this was sometimes called the law of battle. This is males fighting males for the right to have access to the females. Right. And fighting can mean actual, like, hippos beating the heck out of each other. Mm -hmm. Or it can mean singing in birds that you're trying to out-sing the other and make yourself more appealing. It can be like those fish that try to make the best nests. Yeah. You're competing. Doesn't have to be a physical competition, but you are competing for being the, the one who seems most attractive to the opposite sex for mating purposes absolutely so your the other members of your same sex are the enemy during mating season yes and that is by far one of the most common of the the sexual selections and also the most straightforward uh one of the articles put that darwin's understanding of intrasexual selection was pretty much dead on as we understand it today because it's not a very complex concept it's if i beat you up or if i scare you off or if i show off better than you then i get to mate you don't well it's pretty intuitive that if you understand natural selection the idea that certain traits make you more fit to survive and reproduce and in the 1860s and 70s no one understood natural selection better than darwin yep then sexual selection of that kind makes perfect sense same basic mechanism now, except that Except that the choosing, the selection, is not via nature, via resources and predators. It's via each other. Yeah, it's the mates that are really driving that pressure. And that's the focus of intersexual selection. So while intra is me and David fighting over a goyle, intersexual selection is me just showing off to said goyle. Who is being very choosy. And she is now perusing <laughs> the males on display. Once again, usually it's the females being the choosy individual here of them looking at the displays. The males are technically competing, but this it's not them versus each other. It's both. It's each of them focused at the female to try to impress her so that she chooses them. And the reason that competition shows up between the males and the females of the species is because, as we discussed in episode 53, the beneficial scenarios are a little bit different if you're the female versus the male. Mm -hmm. Your The perfect outcome is not the same always for the different sexes. Exactly. And this one is definitely one of the more bizarre aspects of sexual selection because we don't fully understand it. We know it's happening. There are Absolutely animals, birds of paradise, bower birds, where they are displaying for the discretion of the female. And it is all about whether she likes what they're doing or not. So basically what the evolutionary scenario here is females show some preference for some trait in a male. And the males that exhibit that trait best get to mate more. While intrasexual selection ends up resulting in weapons, much of the time, antlers and bigger bodies. This is why so many mammals are bigger in the males than the females, because they're competing. They're showing off to one another, or they're fighting one another. This one is what results in the displays of peacocks, and bright colors, and really exaggerated weird features. Because for whatever reason, and this is where we're not sure, the females preferred that trait and so the males with bigger traits made it more which resulted in bigger traits which made it more and so on and so you get those weird crazy things like you said the peacock feathers, yes which not only are seemingly purposeless otherwise but can actually contradict what natural selection would seem to favor because if you're trying to survive and avoid predators and fly and be mobile and everything, 
having super long tail feathers that are super brightly colored and super flashy is the opposite of that. It's like trying to, to navigate the woods in a dress. Well, it's like, playing, like a long wedding dress. Yeah, it's like playing tag when you have really long hair. You know, yeah. I'm just going to grab it and grab the ponytail. Uh, so it ends up with some really weird things. Now, now, why the females prefer these things is the mystery and is still heavily debated. We don't have a really good answer for why does the female like this weird trait? What is that telling her? Why is that pleasing to her? Now, Darwin's initial explanation, the Darwin model, later known as the Darwin Fisher model, was a explanation, kind of the most straightforward, simple explanation because it dealt with monogamous mating pairs and only two types of, sorry, not, and basically broke it up into saying that there are two types of females, the more, as quoted, the more vigorous and better nourished individuals and the less vigorous and healthy. And then males would also had variety in their quality. And when males would reach the meat, the, when males would reach the breeding ground, the healthier, more vigorous females would get there first and pick the best males. And the less vigorous females would get there second or later and pick the, the less optimal males. So more optimal females and more optimal males would breed, making more optimal babies, which would perpetuate that trait for whatever was most optimal whatever the trait was mm -hmm. and if it was for whatever reason bright feathers that's now being selected now nowadays we kind of have two schools of thought behind why a female would be picking these traits this is all still this is all still heavily debated so don't take this as this is how it work this is what we're thinking because this is it's a very nebulous topic and it's not consistent that's the really hard thing about researching this Every animal is slightly different from the next animal. And even within closely related species, they can have extremely different sexual displays. So it's hard to nail down definite trends. But the two main schools of thought is that the females are looking for either a direct benefit or an indirect benefit. So direct benefit models and indirect benefit models of interspecific sexual selection. We're getting deeper down the rabbit hole. <laughs> So rabbits are a good example. Yes, yes. <laughs> so we need one of them here, an expert on the topic. So for direct benefits, this is meaning that the female gets some sort of direct benefit, some obvious boon to choosing that male. The male can defend more territory. The men will the male will provide better parental care. Right. The male has built a better nest. Built a better nest. It is going to provide food more readily. That. The feature is showing, you know, that the male is going to immediately benefit the the rearing of those children. But this is not always what we see in animals. The indirect benefits model is focusing on the fact that there are many situations, many species where the males provide no help. No. Nothing. No, no territory. No Good nest. Good for nothing. They just provide sperm. They just provide reproductive material, and that's it, and then they leave. And here's where kind of the big question comes in of, well, then what? why did you pick that male? And the idea, the hypothesis, uh, maybe I'm sure it's probably arguable whether there's a theory to be had yet, but the hypothesis here is that the female is seeing the tr that the trait that the female is preferring, that she's focusing on, is telling her something about that male that will end up benefiting her young. Or to put it in a more biological way, the female's not necessarily seeing it and going, oh, those bright feathers mean that he has good genes and I will mate with him, but that that external feature is genetically linked yes. to something that's going to be beneficial so that the females that end up choosing those brightly feathered males are also the piggybacking genetic trait is that those males offspring are going to be real strong or they're going to grow very quickly or whatever it is that's going to help them survive better. And this is called the good gene model. And there's two types of this. Once again, further down that rabbit hole, <laughs> the condition dependent indicator and the con condition independent indicator. Basically what this is saying is that in one case that the 
ornament, the dance, the song, whatever it is, is telling the female that that is a more fit male. That that there's something optimum about its, you know, its health, its viability. And this could be due to the uh, cost of carrying around that thing or that the thing makes them better at something survival-wise. And that those ideal traits will be passed on to the young and make them better at surviving and better at doing whatever it is they were want they were needing to be doing the other one is that the trait is directly linked to some genetic aspect some genetic benefit and that there's that a something about the good genetics causes a better version of that trait this one has less support it's the condition dependent is what most people tend to lean more toward and tend to uh, give more support toward. There's not as much support for the other one, but that basically the idea is that this trait is somehow indicating that this is a healthier, more ideal mate. And there's lots of reasons that could be, because it might be that, well, I've been able to eat real good, and so I've grown big antlers. Or maybe, like the peacock, this is a really difficult tail to carry around. So it is, I must be healthy. Right. To carry this around. That one's known as the uh, costliness. Uh, so that one specifically is the costliness model. That it is a awkward trait and you are showing yourself to be healthy by carrying around. Once again, that one's a little controversial. All of these are slightly <laughs> controversial. Yeah. But those are uh, some of the main models. There's one other that takes kind of the opposite view. And that's the Fisherian model. Named after R.A. Fisher who is an English statistician and evolutionary biologist. This is also known as the sexy sun hypothesis, <laughs> which is a great name. And you'll see why. Fisher argues that there is not a benefit to the trait, genetically or survivability-wise. That when females end up focusing on one of these traits, it could very well be arbitrary. Just one, some weird hair of the genetics causes a female to go, oh, red, I like red, and mate more with a red male which means that their offspring are going to be females that like red and males that have more red. Yep. Which means that those females are going to go looking for more red males and those males are going to get to mate with more red-loving females and that it's all just random. It was random to begin with and then it causes a feedback loop. So yep. now you have really red males and females that love red. I like this because it's very evolutiony. Yes, it is. In that it's just... How a little hiccup somewhere down the line can cause this cascading selection where d for some reason this change happened and now that's how everything is. And it can still be beneficial because those red birds now have a higher mating rate than non-red males, which could have been a higher mating rate than they had before the red for all we like oh, yeah. it absolutely can still benefit even with this randomness. So there's still a, you know, a, a, a. A species benefit to the trait, but that it's not some secret message. It's just for some reason they liked that thing they liked. Just how it is. And it went that way. There are some others. These have less support, but one that I thought was really interesting just to point out was the sensory exploitation model. That there are some animals, and this one has a, a little bit of good, good support to it, that there are some animals that just exploit a genetic fascination by the opposite sex and use that to catch their attention that there's not a, a benefit to it and it's just for you know it's uh the concept that certain animals can hear certain frequencies well if i make my song at that frequency you hear it and you like it better well it's like in the situation you just described that the females just for whatever reason are attracted to red this would uh, if i'm interpreting it correctly be a pressure on males yes to develop more red coloration and go oh well that's what the females are into so the more red a male has, the more often they're going to mate, the more babies they're going to have. It's almost the opposite of the Fisherian model. It's just that happens to be what gets the opposite sex's attention. Mm -hmm. Thus, I am pressured evolutionarily, generationally, to develop more and more and more of it. I'm totally into the bands you're into. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> or rather, my great-grandchildren will totally be into the yes, bands you're into. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Now, sexual selection typically is focused on that it happens before mating happens or mating occurs. 
but that's not the only time it can happen. The obvious version is we compete or we display and then we mate. That was where the selection, the contest happened. Pre-copulatory. Pre-copulatory. Pre-conception. But there is also copulatory and post-copulatory. There are things that can happen during mating. Males can still try to pull a male off of a female mid-mating. Yep. Watch sea turtles if you ever get a chance. It's very <laughs> violent, actually. And post-copulatory can happen as well because females can actually affect some, ty- some species whether or not they get fertilized. Oh, yeah. They, they- can bank the sperm mm-hmm. or they can reject it. And this competition, it, it's important to remember that for a male in the traditional, you know, standard male setup, the best scenario is that the male gets to mate with a ton of females because usually all the male has to do is the mating part and then he can you just bump up and then on the next run one. off onto the next one. Females typically have to put in a ton of effort to create eggs, sometimes to take care of the nest. If you're a live birthing animal, you have to <laughs> carry the whole thing to conception or to, to birth from conception and then probably take care of it. Like, for f- it pays to be choosy for females, and it pays to be promiscuous for males in most animal species that we're familiar with. And this is actually why we get into something called sexual conflict. Because, as you said earlier, the ideal plan for a male is not necessarily the ideal plan for the female. So and, there, sorry. Yeah, and so there are situations where they become counterproductive to one another. And you actually get a arms race against the opposite sex of the same species. They're under opposing selective pressures. The female wants to get one good mating and then be left alone to now take care of that. The males want to mate with everything. And many males have things where they can scoop out the previous male's sperm. Or their sperm will hopefully compete with the other sperm. And the female doesn't want that. She's... I'm ready to lay eggs now. Leave me alone. So you get some very interesting things. There are some very aggressive mating techniques, things like bed bugs, which stab the female to mate, Yeah, which is horrible. But the most famous is waterfowl, ducks. Ducks have genital wars, (laughs) evolutionary (laughs) genital wars, where the male's genitalia and the female's genitalia are constantly trying to outdo one another. The female duck uh, vagina is actively difficult to mate with while the male's penis is actively meant to overcome barriers navigate through (laughs) the obstacle course and it because they're under that same sort of arms race that you would get between predator and prey or between two competitors because genetically it is the best trait for that individual to make it to reproduction. That's the interesting thing about evolution is it doesn't just work on a species level. It can work on a sex level, on a male or female level, which is makes it really complex. So that's basically what sexual selection is. And we've already talked about some of the traits it causes. The evolution of these traits can lead to something known as sexual dimorphism, which I'm sure we've mentioned before. Oh, yes. We've definitely said this word before on the podcast, but to define it, Sexual dimorphism is when there are physical, biological, behavioral, notable differences between the sexes of a species. Yeah. The male and female. Sexual dimorph. Two shapes. Yes. And this is often connected with sexual selection. Strong sexual selection tends to lead to distinct sexual dimorphism because of what we were just talking about. Now, the male and females have very different jobs for their own genetic survival, and they are going to diverge. Species where the males compete intensely tend to have very different male shapes versus female shapes. Big antlers, larger bodies, etc., Absolutely. And this allows them to do a different job than the female would be doing because she's not competing in that case. So they don't need to be as big. They don't need to be as ostentatious. This is why you often find those brightly colored, those brightly colored male birds of paradise with blues and reds and greens and then a brown leaf colored female. Yes. Who's good at hiding? Because she doesn't need to catch anyone's attention. So why risk it? You know, why waste that time? And this is, this gets very interesting because you can often track how 
drastic and in what direction the sexual dimorphism is going to lean based on the parental care provided by the animals. Interesting. So in the typical model where the female provides almost all or at least the vast majority of parental care, typically you're going to find the sexual dimorphism traits more heavily exaggerated in the male. Bright colors, big horns, large bodies, sharp teeth, what whatever it is, is tending to lean that way because whilst the female is going to be busy during long periods of time taking care of the young, that frees up the males to be constantly competing. And as more females sit on nests or more females are, you know, nursing young, they go out of the reproduction lottery and it gets more and more competitive. So every female that gets mated with now makes it more more of a race. There's fewer that you can mate with. And if the males aren't taking care of the babies, they don't lose. They're, they're, there's no benefit to having smaller, you know, the kinds of traits that the females have for that purpose. Yeah. You don't need to be a good dad if you're not going to be a dad. All you have to do. It's like the uh, the soldier ants. Yes. Are all they're about is fighting. They don't even have they can't even feed themselves. Yes, they're so specialized they would not be able to survive without the colony. You have one job, and your job is to compete with other males and find mates. Now, moving toward the the other the middle of that example, if both parents are providing care, or the more pair the more care the male starts to provide, you will get more similar looking, less sexual dimorphism. So if both of them are providing care, you don't need as much competition. Because you're busy taking care of kids. You don't got time to fight other males. That and, kid's hungry. And these are the species that tend also to stick together longer. They'll, Much more monogamous. They'll mate either for life or for extended periods of time. And so there's not as much competition. They're both, they've both developed similar features for similar purposes. Humans are actually a really good example of a not particularly dimorphic species. Absolutely. We, we live fairly similar, or we should live very similar <laughs> lifestyles. <laughs> and we, you know, and it's easy to think that that's weird because it's often quite easy to distinguish male versus female. There are consistent traits that separate the sexes in humans. But if you showed a bunch of humans to like elephant seals yeah. or moose yes. or anglerfish <laughs> like they wouldn't be able to tell the males and females apart no oh, they all look like the same thing i must love, be one of those monogamous species i love whenever alien things make that joke i can't tell them apart <laughs> uh and it's it's true it's you know there are things we can notice but we're meant to notice yes it's kind of important if you're wanting to make a baby so this is a really great example within the the wildlife uh, is things like albatross, you know, seafaring birds. If you look at a male and female albatross, I, I would pay you money if you could tell me which was which, <laughs> if they weren't in the process of laying an egg. You're going to get a phone call from albatross researchers. Yes, like, exactly. Where are you? Oh, I'll take that money. Yes. And so it's you can't know the albatross first. That doesn't count. <laughs> uh, it's, but they look identical because they both take care of the young and they stick together. There's not really much competition because once they mate, they're done. Yep. It's it's married life now. And then you can get the opposite. If the male's the one taking care of the young and the female's not, you will see what they call reverse sexual dimorphism. Now, it's still just sexual <laughs> dimorphism. <laughs> I like rever rever who do you think named that? Yes. Yeah. Now, to be fair... The vast majority of situations with animals, it's the male who is doing the competing because we do have less to do in the whole making a baby realm. True, true. But there are actually numerous occasions where the female is the bigger, more robust, more ostentatious, more decorated, more aggressive. Yep. Where they take on all the typically male traits. And the male's the one who sits on the nest. You see this with a lot of ground-dwelling birds. Yes. Uh, quails and fowl ropes. And then you see the fact that if you were to see it, what would typically be the male traits and female traits are reversed because the male's the one who broods on the nest, not the female. And the females are now competing over good house husbands instead of worrying about nest building and raising an egg. So you can get it both ways. 
Uh, it tends to lean the other way, but this is still just sexual dimorphism. It's not reverse. Yes. Now, because of all of this, oftentimes sexual dimorphism has been used as a gauge for the intensity or presence of sexual selection. The more intense the sexual dimorphism must be some real crazy sexual selection. And though this is often true, it is not the truth. It is not the rule. There are many instances where you get sexual dimorphism without much sexual selection involved in its evolution. So there are many situations where you can get ecological sexual dimorphism, something caused by the environment or caused by other factors in the male-female dynamic. Wallace was one of the first to champion this concept. And we talked about him in episode 54. Indeed. Now, Darwin was aware of it, but the disagreement was on which was more common and which was the 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 bigger aspect of sexual dimorphism. So it wasn't that it was unknown. It just disagreed on why was it usually happening? So to give you some examples of sexual dimorphism that's not because of competition or choosiness is the probably one of the most common are going to be things like insects and many reptiles and some fish where the females are much larger not for competition but because they gotta make a lot of eggs yeah and carry them or either inside or outside Mm -hmm. and this is the most likely reason behind that there could be others but the typical hypothesized reason behind these massive males you see it in things like spiders and uh sharks females are much larger twice the weight of a male and they've gotta carry babies and the males aren't competing with one another like sharks don't do that to the same way there is some of it but it's not the same so that's one reason another one which is very interesting is sexual cannibalism oh (laughs) which is common in spiders and things like praying mantids praying mantises this is a concept where because the female is larger a malnourished a food limited female is more likely when a male approaches to eat him because she's hungry (laughs) than to allow him to mate, which causes the males to actually seek out bigger females, which are more likely to be better fed and therefore less aggressively hungry. Interesting. Which drives the evolution toward bigger females. And the males can also develop all these other interesting behaviors to get around this danger of, Some of them wrap the female up in silk beforehand. Some of them tactically mess with her web to better approach. Some of them wait until she's eating. Some of them bring her something to eat Yep. while he sneaks around and does the deed. And does the deed. (laughs) So you get a lot of interesting things here, none of which are about them selecting one another or competing. It's just because of their nature, this is how it's had to be. But my favorite I came across, which is super weird, is a type of damselfly. Megalibrion califia is a damselfly that was researched. This is uh, actual research by David Punzalan and David Hoskin in Current Biology. There are two different color morphs of these damselflies, which are cousins of dragonflies. The dull colored green morph and the red colored morph that more closely resembles the male. And originally, they thought that this distinction was to help the red females avoid being bothered by males during mating season, because the males can be very, very insistent, and being a, looking more like a male may help them avoid some of that pressure and some of that stress. But when they looked closer, they found that there's actually a distinction of the colors due to altitude, that that the green morphs were more common at low altitudes, and the red colors were more prominent at higher altitudes Hmm. and there did not seem to be a mating distinction between uh, frequency between the two colors so it doesn't seem like they're avoiding males they're not trying to mimic the male there's something about the elevation first idea was that it was thermal regulation higher elevations cooler temperatures so on and so forth but what they found it actually matches more closely with is ultraviolet radiation increases Uh. with elevation and that the red color may be helping them sunblock themselves. Interesting. So it something that's very distinct and sure seems like it should be sexually selected has nothing to do with it. Nope. 
<laughs> so it's not a straightforward topic to research. It's very easy to get mixed signals when looking at the signals animals are sending. And that's one of the things that makes this very difficult to study, which is important as we go into the fossil realm, which is even more difficult to study. Yes. <laughs> How do you tell if we if we have this hard a time decoding sexual dimorphism in living species, extant species, it's just a whole other level of challenging when all you have is fossils. Exactly. So we will dive into how do we try to do that and what do we kind of know so far after this break. So when it comes to examining the fossil record for evidence of sexual selection, you A, run into the immediate problem that we ran into with our fossil behavior discussion of they're not doing it anymore. No. So we can't watch it happen. Not usually. Not usually. But there's no longer any behavior going on there. So now we have to look for the features, evidence of adaptations for sexual selection. And there are two immediate main tools for this. Most of this information, just so you all know, I'll link to this, but it's from uh, Nell et al. in Trends in Ecology and Evolution, which was an amazing summation of our knowledge and approaches to fossil sexual selection. So take that, take a look at that. There are two main ways to first look at it. And one is homology, which is looking at homologous uh, examples is looking at homologous examples, which is when a fossil animal still has extant close relatives. Right. Fossil deer, modern deer. Yep. Antlers in the fossil record, antlers today. We can pretty much say, yeah, those are going to be used for the same stuff. In, at least in most cases, that's a pretty strong indication. Safe bet. If you have, you know, animals that are showing, you know, tusks in modern animals that are showing up in their fossil relatives. So that one's a pretty done deal. Antlers, uh, stalks, uh, eye stalks, and uh, certain insects that use that for display. Yeah. All sorts of stuff like that. And some of them go back quite a way. There's, uh, there's diopsid flies, which are the stalk eye flies from the Eocene that still have those stalk eyes or had those stalk eyes that they still their relatives still have today that are used for display to the females by the males. Long poles that their eyes are on the end of, very weird looking. Cretaceous earwigs already showed those characteristic claspers, the cerci Ooh. on their abdomen, which males today, at least of maritime earwigs, use to compete with one another for territory and access to females. So some things like, yes, you are identical in shape and you've been that way for quite some time and these are handy because they allow us to do a thing that you often can't do in the fossils is distinguish male from female yes which is really really important for identifying sexual selection usually because yep. it's about the sexes you you need to know which one's which to identify what's going on so sexually dimorphic species can be real handy because you find a fossil outside of it having babies inside of it or preserving its penis preserve uh, fossilized it can be very very difficult to tell male from female so sexually dimorphic species are real handy if you can correctly identify sexual dimorphism yes which can be tricky and that becomes more tricky with the other side of the fossil record which are those who do not have homologous uh, examples these are analogous animals ones who we don't have a direct descendant or relative of so we have to use analogies all right the frills on a triceratops look similar to the frill on a chameleon so maybe they're being used in a similar way the horns of this dinosaur or of this ancient mammal kind of look like this animal's horn so you know the feathers on this dinosaur resemble the feathers on this modern bird or this fossil bird you know resembles this modern bird and with some of those you can get you know have something that at least you can point to there are some that don't even have a good analogy 
No. And these start getting really tricky. One of the biggest ones that I always think of are the spine brush finned sharks. Oh, like Stethacanthus. Stethacanthus was a prehistoric shark relative that its dorsal fin on the males had a flat like iron thing on top with really exaggerated denticles, little teeth sticking off of it. How was it using that? Was that just display? Was there competition? Was there some other reason that was helpful? We don't have anything like that nowadays. There's nothing to compare it to, which makes it very difficult to ascertain its purpose. And this is, uh, there, there is sort of this kind of joking, kind of not joking trend in paleontology that you'll come across a feature now and then, and if there's not really an obvious function for it, sexual selection is usually a good bet. Yes. That this animal has this weird frill or these weird spines. They don't seem to be beneficial to survival. There's a good chance this is some sort of sexual feature, a display feature. But it can be very difficult to know that because, again, it's behavior. And also because you might not have a whole population of that animal. If you only have one, you don't know if there's a difference between males and females. Absolutely. And there have been plenty of instances where it's only long after knowing about an animal that we discovered the purpose of a feature. Mm -hmm. The paddlefish is an example of this. If you ever have gotten to see a paddlefish, they're these big freshwater fish with a long protuberance on their nose, a big Pinocchio nose that's flattened like a paddle. And we did not know what it was for. There were some that thought it might be for hydrodynamics, but it, un but recently with microscopy, they were able to see that it actually has electrosensors. Neat. And it's used for sensory. Uh, uh, it's used as a sensory organ for the fish. How many of these fossil weird body parts had something similar that only under close analysis would we be able to tell? Or only the soft tissue would reveal its purpose? So you have to be careful about assuming the purpose or comparing it to a modern one because just because they look similar doesn't mean they're used in a similar way you know if i put if i put down the claws of multiple birds of prey it'd probably be hard for you to tell me which one ate fish and which one doesn't because they all look roughly the same there's little differences but they're not ridiculously different so you have some trouble there which means one of the biggest tools for identifying potential sexual selection in the fossil record is to identify sexual dimorphism now, we already said that is not a guarantee for sexual selection. So already, this is not a perfect system. Yep. But if you have sexual dimorphism, the vast majority of examples of that in the animal kingdom are due to some amount of sexual selection. So it would at least be strong support toward that. Now, how do you do that? <laughs> it's not easy. There's a couple of issues that you run into immediately. First off, you need, as David already said, a sizable population. Even sexually dimorphic males and females still usually have overlap. Yep. Like, that's what people will always ask me. How do you tell the difference between a male and a female alligator? Wait until one of them grows over 10 feet. <laughs> or lays eggs. Yeah. Until that point, there's no physical way to distinguish them unless you go check their cloaca. Oftentimes what you'll see fossil studies do is if you have enough of a species, you can put the take measurements on all of them, all the bones that you have, throw it into a computer program and say, hey, show me the distribution of sizes. And if you have sexual dimorphism and you're lucky, what you'll see is two clusters. Yes. A smaller cluster and a larger cluster, usually with some overlap, that suggests that your species came generally in two different size classes. Yeah. Now, the danger you run into here is how do you tell sexual dimorphism apart from closely related species? Yes. And this has happened. Diornis, which is the giant moa of New Zealand, when initially described by Owen in the 19th century, was described as three separate species, Robustus, Nova Zealandia, and Struthoides. It was only with recent genetic research that they were able to identify that all the struth struthoides were actually males and all the robustus were actually females <laughs> of the same species. Oops. So three species became two, and 
two of those species were all male and female because female are about twice the size t- height wise and three times the weight of a male <sighs> extremely sexually dimorphic to the extent that they didn't even look like the same animal yeah you mentioned anglerfish earlier for anyone who doesn't know deep sea anglerfish the really ugly ones with the lights hanging off of them and the big snaggly teeth like finding nemo that's a female what you're thinking of right now is a female the male is this itty bitty no lights no big teeth little minnow looking thing that finds a female bites onto it and then fuses to her to basically become a pair of gonads yep and she just uses sperm from his now obsolete body to fertilize eggs if you saw that in the fossil record, it would be super easy to assume those were different species. Or if you imagine like ants, a mm-hmm. worker ant versus a queen ant, so morphologically different, it'd be easy to mistake them without the living context. Well, even with modern anglers, without genetic studies, how would you not just say, wow, that's a weird parasite? Yes. It Sometimes it's very difficult. Now, there's also the issue of mutual sexual selection, which is where both members of the species both display and have features. And it's only recently that it's been considered that this could be the reason why we see species of dinosaurs, species of fossil animal with exaggerated traits across the species. Maybe they're all showing off to each other, kind of like the albatross that are dancing with one another. And so you could get traits being bred in that don't cause sexual dimorphism, but cause exaggerated features monodimorphic or monomorphic across the species and then the real kicker which we've already touched on but is multifunctional traits how do you know that sexual trait isn't being used for something else something that has an obvious purpose might also be sexual selection trait one of the examples they give which i really like is the eye stalked trilobites there are trilobites with these little periscope eye stalks very much like the flies we mentioned earlier. Yeah. Originally, it was proposed that these were used for spy eyeing above the sand while being buried below the sediment. Like little periscopes. Little periscope, Literally, boop, up periscope. But, and that's very similar to how we see like fiddler crabs that have long eye stalks for peeking out of their burrows. But why couldn't they be sexual selection eye stalks? Also. Yes. So they could be doing one job. They could be doing the other. They could be doing both. Yeah. So you get into that. A really cool example that I saw where they did research on was Diplocalus, which is the famous big amphibian that you all know. The big boomeranged head. Yeah. Ancient amphibian. Very famous. Very famous. Wide, wide head with two large projections pointing backward from either side of the head that looks for all intents and purposes like a boomerang. This has been suggested to be lots of different things. One of the suggestions is that it's a sexual display. Look how awesome my head crest is. You know, come over and talk to me. But they've also done hydrodynamic studies and found that it would allow them to use it as a control surface in moving water. So in a river system, they could use that kind of as a hydrofoil to, in moving water, have better control and hunt more easily in the water column. Cool. So was it doing one? Was it doing the other? Was it doing both? It's hard to say. Evolution loves multitasking. It does. It does indeed. So what do we look for to try to identify a sexually dimorphic trait? What things do we try to see for a sexually selected trait in a fossil organism? And there are a few trends. None of these are 100% by even (laughs) a stretch of the imagination. But these, if you can find especially multiple of these supporting evidences, can give you a, a clue that you might be looking at something that was evolved to attract the attention of that pretty looking animal over there. The first one is changes in the growth rate of the feature during ontogeny so that it starts growing faster at a different point in life, that it's not a consistent growth rate. You know, you don't start with a little bump on your nose and it grows continually until you're big, that it comes in at a certain time in life. You know, the horns are teeny tiny nubs. And then suddenly, during what we would assume would be dino puberty, yep, they yep. you become a man. You are now your voice drops and you've got <laughs> more. That's a pretty strong evidence that you evolved it for a specific time of life. You start growing horns in places you didn't have horns yep, before. Yep, we know your body's going through some weird changes. <laughs> we were there too, and so this could very well be 
evidence that you didn't need this trait until sexually mature. Now you need it to compete or to display or what have you. And when we have good ontogenetic sequences, ontogeny, episode 33, growth through the life of the animal, or if you can see that in the bone histology, yes, the, you, you one way or the other, you say, this feature didn't show up until they were sexually mature, until they were five years old or 10 years old or whatever that for that species is. That's a trait that is apparently only useful for an adult. And that's a pretty strong signal. That doesn't mean there couldn't be other purposes for that. Maybe you switch your ecological niche, your niche from young to old. You know, I'm browsing in the forest. Now I'm going to go out to the field that I'm bigger and I need a different tool. So there could be other reasons. But we do see trends like this in certain of the crested hadrosaurs, the duckbills and the ceratopsians like triceratops have a definite ontogeny with their frills and horns. So there are there is evidence for this, but... It's never a guarantee. A similar factor to this, but different mathematics, is positive allometry. This is where it's not that it pops in later on, but it grows at an increasing rate. The bigger you get, the faster it grows. So it gets even bigger each time you're getting bigger. So your wacky head crest is growing faster than the rest of your body, so that by the time you are an adult... It is useful to you. It is ridiculous compared to when you were young. And this is by no means a guarantee. There are lots of examples of features that do this. Because this can also, you see positive allometry with having to deal with bigger weight and stuff like that. But for a distinct, odd feature, it's very rare we see positive allometry without some form of sexual dimorphism or sexual selection involved to cause it. But the main drawback to this one is with our past one, you need somewhat of a growth series, but histology can tell you a good bit. For this one, you need a very solid growth series because you need all the middle steps to chart that growth rate. So if you only have a couple specimens, you can't really use positive allometry for your sexual selection research. So this one has a drawback in that fact. The last one is, to me, one of the most interesting But it's also one of the most subjective, so it's Mm. mm, shaky ground for research, is costliness. Ah. We mentioned earlier that one of the things that can often happen when you've developed a trait for sexual selection is that it's not practical. It's impractical to survival. Yep. Too many feathers. Your antlers are too big. You're ridiculous and weird looking. So if you come across a fossil organism that just has something that is laughably proportioned (laughs) it's it might be because it was to attract not to survive it was meant to be ridiculous yep so now this one it's very subjective yeah like you said sometimes we just don't know what the other function was and we're assuming it didn't have a non-sexual function absolutely like if you showed me a toucan bill i would assume that that was just for show oh yeah And then you watch them use it to kill lizards and baby (laughs) birds. And you go, oh, okay, no, that's really... I'm sure it also helps with showing off, but it's useful. I'm impressed. They also radiate heat with it to thermoregulate. Probably also the coloration breaks up the outline of the face so that it's harder to spot them. So it's hard. It's really difficult, everyone. (laughs) I don't have a really nice, but here's how you can tease it out. And here's how you know. Because if modern sexual selection is controversial, just imagine how controversial fossil sexual selection is. And all of this is assuming that your organism has sexual features at all. Yep. This is like, it is perfectly reasonable to have an animal that doesn't really have sexually exaggerated features. They're just all one way and they survive that way and it works. Yeah, it doesn't have have to happen there are a lot of animals that don't have very strong sexual selection they they meet up make a baby and then continue on with life yep or if there is sexual selection for things like behavior or whatnot it's not necessarily reflected in the morphology Mm -hmm. well and sometimes it can be socially created like if you think of a pack of dogs there's definitely sexual selection and competition going on but it's hierarchy the dominant male and female are the mating pair, everyone else takes care of their babies. At least in your typical timber wolf pack. Yes. So 
there's weird sexual selection going on here, but you can't tell physically because it's all about behavior. I'm dominant because I beat you, and therefore I could have babies. And that's that. That's that. We don't have yearly competitions because until I die or a bigger wolf usurps us, we're in charge. So it gets complicated. Now, we do have a couple of times where the studies have given us some pretty good indications that there was sexual selection going on. Oh, boy. So I, I have there's lots and lots of examples out there. I'm going to pick from the favorite ones I found. The first is from one of my... Uh, this always has a soft spot in my heart. Protoceratops. Cool dinosaur. I love Protoceratops. Protoceratops andrewsi is... The famous little ceratopsian, little cousin of Triceratops, no horns, frilled, lived in Mongolia during the Cretaceous period, and was about the size of a, a big pig. Yeah, like six feet long. Yeah. Two feet tall or so. Not very large. Good hog-sized dinosaur. Well, they are also notably well-preserved. We have a, a oh, yes. large, large samples of them. One of my favorite displays at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City is a row of an ontogenetic series of protoceratops skulls. And there's like 10 or 15 skulls in this, and they go from very tiny gradually up to full size. And it's super cool. It's beautiful. Now, this was researched by Hone et al. in Paleontological Electronica. And this research, this research took 37 protoceratops fossils, and this went from tiny juveniles to the largest adults and they measured dimensions of the skull specifically looking at the frill that armored plate on the back of their head it's the frill and they found that bigger protoceratops had proportionately larger and wider frills they also found that the frill seemed to spread out wider around the head in the older individuals while smaller animals the frill laid more flat against the neck so it lifts up gets big and spreads out like a fan flares out flares out and this seems to strongly support that it was being used for display within the species in adulthood in adulthood now this does not guarantee sexual selection they do say it could be for hierarchy my frills bigger i'm in charge right right my frills wider you know, I'm the one who gets to pick where we eat. But it they think it is a very good support for it being a sexually selected trait. And they also note that we don't have any of the soft tissue or coloration, so there's also potentially it could be display on it. You know. Yeah. If there's if we ever find evidence of color on it, that would be even further support for a sexually selected trait. So it seems those frills were being used for more than just defense, which I appreciate because whenever it was described that the frill was defensive, I used to always be confused as a kid because that wasn't straight. That wasn't just directly intuitive to me. It's like, all right, that kind of makes sense, but it only works in one direction for one spot. Yeah, behind your face. Yeah. Well, and I think that also, even if it did evolve with a defensive purpose or something, that's a lot of real estate. Yes. That's Perfect for display. Absolutely. And it would make sense that those extreme... I mean, some of the frills on some of the ceratopsians, where you have horns sticking off that are hooked back down oh, yeah. toward your face, what is that doing? It's super intimidating. It looks cool. And maybe that's the point. Yes. So, some evidence there. But, favorite bit of research I found is in pterosaur crests Ooh, now we're in the air so on certain pterosaurs they would show crests and some of these were bony some of them were soft tissue that has shown at least some preservation others seem like they were expanded by soft tissue but had a bony base lots of variety there are many reasons there are many solutions to the purpose of of these crests that people have suggested. Some said that maybe it acts as a sail or a rudder while flying mm -hmm. to help them steer with their face. Which is weird. Which is weird. Others have suggested that it could be for thermoregulation, you know, to get rid of extra heat or yeah. soak up extra heat or what have you. Makes sense. But then, of course, display. Yeah. 
it, it's a big flag on your nose, which we see in animals today that have big displays on their nose. Yeah, or like the dewlaps underneath that lizards have under their, their throats and such. Absolutely, that little flag that they can spread out during the right time of year. Well, there are two species that have these crests. They're not the only two species, but the two species that some research has been done on. One is Pteranodon longiceps, yeah. the Pteranodon, which is late Cretaceous, North America, very large, and we have enough specimens to tell that males, which are identified by more narrow pelvis, that ah. doesn't need to lay an egg, are proportionately larger. Not ridiculously, there is still some overlap, but enough of an average that they are larger. And while both crests, while both sex have a cranial crest, those of the males are considerably larger than the females. Interesting. So the males have that crest, that famous crest on the back of the head, and the males seem to have a much more exaggerated one than the females and are physically larger. And that's a real good indicator that you have a sexual display feature. And to look at, well, was it doing something? They put it through a wind tunnel and they didn't see that it helped with aerodynamics. Interesting. So it doesn't seem to have, at least for flying, a physical use other than looking cool. Just a bunch of extra bone and tissue doing nothing else hanging out back there. And the icing on top is it does seem to be positively allometric. Ah, it's, so it grows faster as you get bigger. So these are all good signs that that crest was a way for a male to show off to a female within pteranodons. Cool. The other one I want to talk about is kind of the golden the golden scenario of research into sexual selection within fossil animals. Darwinopteris modularis is a pterosaur from the Middle Jurassic in China, and there's an amazing find with them, research done by Lu et al. in Science, where several individuals were found. It was able to be identified that some of the individuals had crests, some didn't, the ones with crests had more narrow pelvises, and the ones that didn't had wider pelvises, and one of the wide pelvis individuals had an egg. Oh boy. Next to the pelvis. So now we have almost certainly identified male and female, wide pelvis, no crest females, crested, narrow crest pelvis males, and we also can see definite sexual dimorphism. This is one of the, where the fossil record just went, you know what? We're going to give you this one we're, for free. We're going to throw you a bone. Just just well, a lot of bones. <laughs> yeah, just just one. And that's now as awesome as that is, that's kind of what you have to have. Yeah. To without a doubt say, yes, sexual dimorphism. You still can't for sure say it was sexual selection as we've already mentioned cuz you do see weird things when it comes to you know, notable shapes. We mentioned the spiders, another one that is a great example of male and females being shaped different for different reasons. Certain woodpeckers have different bills so that the male and female don't compete for the same insects while oh, interesting. boring into the wood. Interesting. So who knows for sure, but a big flag on your nose doesn't seem to have many adaptive traits. Yep. Other than getting the attention of other pterosaurs. <laughs> There have also been a couple of studies looking for sexual dimorphism in the gray fossil site. Yes, there have been. There are two that come to my mind. One is with our red pandas. Cool. So there was a study that our friend Ethan, hey, remember him from episode seven? Primate yeah. guy. Ethan and Dr. Wallace from ETSU did a study in 2015 looking at the red panda. So we have two ridiculously complete fossil red panda skeletons at the gray fossil site. And what's really interesting about them is one of them is noticeably larger than the other one, but also younger. Yeah. It is a young adult that is huge compared to the much more aged, but smaller second one. And they did a bunch of analyses because now having only two makes it very difficult to say anything. It's very small sample size. But they compared some of the skull features to certain living animals that have male-female differences and found some similar differences. The younger, bigger one had some more male-looking traits and the older, uh, smaller one did not. 
And, as Sean was explaining to me the other day, if you take our red panda fossils, because we have remains of at least eight red pandas. Yes. Only two of them are super complete, but we have bits and pieces. Sean was describing that about half of them are relatively small and the other half of them are relatively large. So what Ethan and Wally concluded is that what we're probably looking at is a young male and an older female of this red panda species, which is really cool because modern red pandas are not sexually dimorphic. Which just adds another layer of this being a weird red panda. So they are under certain types of presumably sexual selection that the modern pandas are not. The other study at the Gray Fossil Site, I think this was uh, this was a project by one of the former grad students, Aaron, I believe, who the first Aaron, not the second Aaron, who looked at the tapirs. Because we have this whole big tapir population. There's like a hundred. He had, it wasn't as many back then, but dozens to look at looking for that differentiation and did not find it. Nope. As far as that study concluded, our tapirs are indistinguishable by, at least, I think it was cranial morphology? I forget exactly what it was. But whatever portion of the body they were looking at, yeah, they just all look the same. Which is, I, it's very interesting which animals do and don't show which traits. Yeah. Very cool. Now, with all of this awesome research to be said, I did feel obligated to put in one bit of research I found, which was titled Recognizing Sexual Dimorphism in the Fossil Record, Lessons from Non-Avian Dinosaurs. <laughs> and in this, they did what they described as the first statistical investigation of sexual dimorphism across din dinosauria. Now, this is by Jordan Mallon from Paleobiology. And basically, they revisited a number of analyses that had either proposed or claimed to identify sexual dimorphism in different species of dinosaurs. And then they uh, subjected them to a battery of statistical analyses that I can't even begin to explain. <laughs> but they just ran them through a whole list of statistical studies to try to identify sexual dimorphic trends. And they did it with nine dinosaur species. I'm not going to list them all right now, but one of them was our protoceratops. Nice. And they found no thing conclusive uh. on any of them. <laughs> this is not to say... Sexual dimorphism or selection is not present. They even say that phylogenetically, we would expect it. But these didn't pass at least this statistical test. So it's very murky. This is very, yeah. These are very murky waters to tread into. It's really hard to identify. And I don't really have a good in cap to this, this whole topic. It's cool, but it's tricky to study in the fossil record. Sometimes when you don't have a good... And here's the wrap up and it's all nice ending. I like to end by throwing my hands in the air. <laughs> and whenever I think about trying to identify males versus females in the fossil record, I always think about elephant seals. Yes. For those of you who aren't aware, elephant seals. So the, the, the classic example of elephant seals is you have those big, just stupid, hulking, not stupid like they're dumb. Don't tell them I said that. No, no. But just, why are you that big? J with the big noses and they're making those awful noises they make. Males dominating the beach and murdering each other for territory. And then you have groups of females. Harems, mm -hmm. as they are called. And the females are much smaller, much quieter. <laughs> the females just look like seals. And yeah. the males look like monsters. <laughs> yes. And so you look and you say, oh... Very clear sexual dimorphism, except that there are male elephant seals that in, in, instead of developing features to compete with the big bull males, look like females. No, no nose trunk. Same size and act like females. And the strategy is while the big males are fighting and dominating the harem, the Female-like males. The sneaky males. The sneaky males are hanging out in the harem and mating with the females when they can. It's like the movie Tootsie, but with <laughs> elephant seals and to, to survive not getting killed by the giant males. And so there are two sexually selected beneficial strategies for males. 
one is to be super different, and one is to be very feminine. To put it in very anthropomorphic terms, the elephant seals have three genders. Yes. The classic female, the masculine male, and the feminine male. And the thought that we could come across a dinosaur species in the fossil record or something that did something similar, that you would have two morphs and one of the morphs is both male and female. Yep. Or that you could have three morphs because there's two different kinds of males or two different... Or who knows how many, like, huh. and that's when I throw my hands in the air and I say, you know what? We're never going to know some stuff. We're just never going to know. It's, it is, there's so many different avenues and complexities. Cuttlefish, certain cuttlefish do the exact same thing. And the males that pretend to be females can even put the female color on one side to trick a male while putting the male color on another side to attract a female half and half. Because cuttlefish are Cause aliens. Cu- so... This is a topic that <laughs> we are still teasing out with modern taxa. Yes. So it is not impossible, but it is extremely tough to find unarguable evidence for it in the fossil record. And what a fascinating subject. Oh, it's so cool and weird. I love it. It's just bizarre. Now, this would typically be the end of our episode, but we have a patron question. Oh, goody. Because like at the beginning of the episode, if you sign up for Patreon at a certain level, we'll shout your name out when you sign up. But also if you sign up at that certain level and you send us a question, we'll answer it right here on the podcast. Indeed we will. And we have a question from Finley who says, I'm curious about dinosaurs with sails on their backs. Have there been many fossils found that showed the development of the sail? I feel like I've never come across dinosaurs with only half a sail and whatnot an interesting question very finley. intriguing now i'm not certain if finley's referring to the development ontogenetically or evolutionarily my guess is evolutionarily since the half a sail thing but i'll answer both haha <laughs> that's what you get <laughs> this yeah this is what you get if, you, if you're vague you just get more information haha <laughs> it shows you <laughs> So I f- I did find uh find <laughs> so I did find a study on ontogeny of the sail in uh, the ornithopod dinosaur Oranosaurus. So this was iguanodon like, but had a sail, which is so cool. Yes, and it was a study that found similar to what we were just discussing. In the histology, the way that the vertebra... Because what the sail is, is the vertebral spines. Yes, your backbone spines stretching out. So if you feel your back, especially up by your neck, you'll feel that row of bumps. That is the neural spines on the back of your vertebrae. It's the part that does all the gross stuff in The Incredible Hulk when Abomination is transforming. Yeah, that. Yeah. (laughs) In Oranosaurus, this uh, one bit of research found evidence that the spines didn't start developing their crazy length until the Oranosaurus were about three years old. Hmm. Closer to adulthood. A sexually selected trait, perhaps. Which makes so much more sense to me than just thermoregulation. It's such an exaggerated, ridiculous feature. Yeah, it really is. Now, in that case, the reason... So, half a sail would really just be a half-grown sail. It's puberty sail. So if you found an Oranosaurus that was halfway through the development of its sail, it wouldn't be like the front half or anything like that. It would just be (laughs) half-height. As it gradually but quickly for the dinosaur grew from relatively normal spine height to the full Oranosaurus spine height, which I believe was about two feet tall. It hasn't even grown into its sail yet. (laughs) evolutionarily speaking, half a sail would also look pretty much just like a short sail. Yeah. So when we think of sails, we're looking, you know, Spinosaurus and Dimetrodon. Spinosaurus's spines got up to you know, like five feet yeah. long or like something almost crazy. Almost as tall as us. But as we discussed in episode 42, Spinosaurs, most members of the Spinosaur family had longer neural spines. Mm-hmm. So we talked about Ichthyovenator, the one with the sinusoidal dorsal sacral sail. Yes. That had two sails, one on the tail and one on the back. And those were, those spines 
were not quite as long as what you see in Oranosaurus, and then Oranosaurus is a little longer, and then you have Suchomimus, and you have Acrocanthosaurus, which is in a whole other group. Yeah. That the Carcharodontosaurians, Oranosaurus is a Iguanodontine, and they, well, a relative of Iguanodon. I don't know if it's an Iguanodontine proper. Mm-hmm. Just sails of differing heights, and logically speaking, the evolutionary lead up to something crazy exaggerated like Spinosaurus would probably just be a successively taller and taller sail. Yeah, it's, it's you know, it, if bigger is better, you know, just a little bit bigger is better, and then just a little bit bigger is better. So each size is useful and, and can do the same job, just bigger might do the job better, or now does it slightly differently. So different Spinosaurs settled at least the port part point in time where we have found those species had hit certain heights of the sail spinosaurus had gone very exaggerated bonkers different groups of dinosaurs had just developed and it's like you see this in in certain animals today use those neural spines not for sails but like look, look at a bison skeleton if you were to just glance at a bison skeleton you'd think it had a sail and they use it to support those big humps. Which is so cool. On their backs. So intimidating. So I think development-wise, evolutionarily, it just would have been following selection for tall spines for whatever. On to genetically, depending on the purpose of those spines, in Oranosaurus, they appear to be a adult feature. And so the reason that we probably haven't seen a lot of Oranosaurus with half-developed sales, you know, half-height sales or whatever is because when they're young, they probably look very much like normal ornithopods, and there's a short window of time in their lives that their spines are going through a growth spurt. Yeah, so you'd have to catch them, like like I made the joke, you'd have to catch them during puberty. Yes, which in that is, awkward phase. is not the majority of any animal's life. Unless they have high school yearbook photos. Yeah. Ooh. That'll get it. Oh, and... That's the last thing they want you to find. <laughs> well, awesome question, Finley. Thank you. Thanks for bringing that up. That was a cool topic. And thanks, everyone, for listening to us talk about weird animal mating practices. I hope you enjoyed it. This was a, I had a lot of fun looking this topic up. There's a ton I couldn't get into, so I will put up lots of links on the blog post. So go check it out as usual for links and pictures and all sorts of cool stuff like that. If you liked anything about this episode, tell us. If you have comments or questions about anything we went over, tell us. Please. If you want us to talk about something we didn't or something completely random, tell us. Please. On all the usual ways, email, social media, hit us up on the blog, all the places. If you want to hear more recordings of us, we do put extra stuff on Patreon, so check us out there. Always feel free to check out the store because there's merch there with our name on it that you can wear around look for links to that in the podcast description also keep an ear out for more kaijun all through the month we'll be at napc at the end of june keep an ear out for updates on that also we'll be on the social medias doing oh all the stuff pictures and stuff we release new episodes every fortnight fortnightly and i want to take this moment to say will it's so cool to be in the same room it's so it not only is it so much easier it's so much more fun it's so like it it feels like we're finally talking to each other yeah we get to be (laughs) friends again yeah how about that (laughs) this is the beginning of the end listeners. this is it all goes downhill (laughs) and and it indeed did not go well and indeed it went down well episode 80 We'll be like, and then some animals remember to wash the dishes at the end of the day. I'm sure they would if the other animals took out the trash. <laughs> uh, so mark this as the beginning, <laughs> the beginning of the end for the Common Descent podcast. Thanks for listening, everyone, and we'll catch you next time. See you then. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. 
The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.